Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, good evening, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. My name is Shabir Razvi. I'll be hosting the program this evening. Today's program, as you know, is organized by Open Discussions in association with the Gulf Cultural Club. Today, or this week, marks the 35th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. Dare I say, the Islamic Revolution is almost as old as I am, so you know, um, it, things have gone on for 35 years and they have become part of the geopolitical conversation and dialogue. Iran and the revolution in Iran is there, is not going away, and I think the topic for this evening Iran and the world, a truth or a new chapter, is really a topic which needs to be considered um, in an unbiased manner, in a manner which is really conducive for dialogue, uh, which is conducive for humanity, which is conducive for this planet. Uh, I just want to sort of move the discussion and introduce our guest um, we've got um, four speakers, two of them are just um, going to be joining us shortly, the other two are here, and I'll introduce the speakers as we go. Today's program would not take place if we don't have the health support and the sort of hard work of brother Dr. Saeed Shahabi and Fatima Dosa. Yeah. Today, it's also interesting to note that the new chief executive of Microsoft was appointed. He's an Indian from southern India. And uh, it's, you know, the world is changing. Microsoft, a global company, appoints an Indian to lead what is going to be the next phase of technology and development. So we are in a different territory. And also to quote Oscar Wilde, paraphrasing, he said that we need to believe in the impossible and remove the improbable. And I think that's what's happening with Iran and the rapprochement or the dialogue that's taking place. Um, I have spoken on a number of occasions and I believe the situation is that we have in the West experienced an economic crisis for the last five years. Um, and only today, a hundred strong delegation of French business people is in Tehran knocking on the door. So things are happening. It's a very fluid environment. Um, it's a very fluid environment. Yes, of course, sanctions have had their impact on Iran, but I think it's a two-way traffic insofar as business is concerned. I think the West needs Iran as much as Iran needs West. And Brother Said told me that do not be biased, so I'm trying not to be biased at all in this particular opening comment. Um, because really, from an economic perspective, um, um, you know, as I said, Iran needs the West as much as the West needs Iran. And recently I was at a seminar at King's College a couple of weeks ago on energy security. And the head of the energy security there who had recently visited Iran, I forget his name, German professor, he said potentially with Iran having oil and gas together could be the premier provider of energy to this planet. So it's not a, it's not a country which is small in any context, Economically, it could potentially be powerful, and also politically, I think it's, it's um, certainly become quite an important player in that region, if not on the global horizon. So we've got a lot to discuss this evening, and I do not want to take too much time of our speakers. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who has come quite often, and thank you very much, as usual, for joining us, uh, Thomas Fenton. You've seen his biography. I will not go through the whole detail of the biography. Suffice to say that um, um, Tom Fenton has been a journalist and in the media for many, many years um, and certainly has uh, contributed in the knowledge. And I think his sort of uh, book, which is sort of really quite useful for people to look at, is The Bad News, The Decline of Reporting, the business of news and the danger to us all, um, which was published in, nine, in 2005. So I would request Tom to make his presentation today 
on US-Iran, the long, arduous road to rapprochement. Thank you very much. You're Please welcome, welcome Tom. It is indeed a long road, and I'm a little older than our moderator. I have been covering events off and on in Iran since the 1960s. Uh, in October 1978. Sorry, excuse me. Take one. Please, yes. Thank you. I feel, I feel like you've got me surrounded. <laughs> Thank you. In, in October 1978, I, uh, I went to Iran to report on the, the situation there. I had to talk CBS News, my employer, to uh, allow me to do it. They wondered why I wanted to go there. And I had been contacted beforehand by several Iranian uh, emigres close to uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, what I found in Iran both surprised me and, uh, and, and it also surprised my bosses back in New York because I found there was immense unrest. The, there was the corruption that we all know existed in, under the old regime. There was the suppression of, of free speech. There was Savak, um, the whole story. And I came to the conclusion that the position of the Shah of Iran was extremely precarious. So I did, I did my report, uh, sent it off to New York, and they, CBS never read it. They presumably didn't believe what their own reporter could see, and instead were relying on the State Department, which seemed to think that the, the, the movement, the anti-Shah movement, was poorly organized and not very efficient. Ever since then, I, I have found that there has been a constant misreading of Iran quite often by not just the West, but by uh, the United States in particular. Incidentally, a month after I did that report that <clears throat> CBS did not, did, did not uh, air, I had a, an interview with uh, Homedi, Ayatollah, and in this interview of he was he was like someone I'd never met before. He was very uh, an extremely strong personality. But I asked him at one point whether he could envision normal relations with the United States. You know, he was talking about uh, they would have a referendum, they would get rid of the monarchy, uh, etc. And his answer was there could be no normal relations or friendly relations, unless they were on a new and more equal basis. That was 35 years ago. Um, later, uh, during the long 444 days of the seizure of the American embassy and the captivity of the 52 American uh, hostages, uh, I, I, I got a pretty good feel for what was going on. There were these daily demonstrations. The students following the line of the imam, as they called themselves, the, the, they were, for me, they were youngsters. Uh, a number of them had been, uh, had been educated in the United States, were very, very media savvy. And they knew what television was. You, you want pictures, exciting pictures. Things that burn, like the flag, uh, the, the mass demonstrations. And we had the same thing night after night, night after night. This, the seizure of the American embassy was, in domestic terms, uh, a very smart move by those who uh, were behind it, because it meant there was no turning back from the, the revolution. Uh, they, they literally burnt their bridges behind them. So tactically, uh, domestically, perhaps in the short term, it was a smart move. In the long term, it has made it extremely difficult for Iran and the United States to approach each other as 
normal countries with normal relations. Uh, it just had a devastating effect on American public opinion. And even, you know, even now, uh, the United States produces a, a movie on, uh, on the hostage situation. Uh, you, you, you may have seen the film, I, I, I don't know, what was the name of it? it was, uh, Argo. Argo. Yes, Argo. That's not the Iran that I knew when I was there. It, uh, it, a, a, good, a good deal of what was happening was, uh, was a political show. Uh, I, you know, I can tell you about, for example, you know, I was be covering the, uh, our daily story from Iran, you know, more death to America, covering the stories in front of the embassy. Uh, and there would be students coming up the street, you know, death to America, death to Carter. And I remember one day they, they spotted us with the CBS camera. <laughs> CBS News, they said, oh, are you from New York? Do you know? And this, this is sort of the way it was. It, I'm not saying it was a show. It was just, it was something they were doing uh, to, uh, to influence American public opinion. Oh boy, did they. And that's, that's one reason why it has taken so long for us to get to this point where the unthinkable is, at least from American, the American point of view, is now thinkable. Now, I'm speaking to you primarily as a reporter. And I'm, what I'm telling you is what intelligent Americans, policymakers, people who, uh, uh, who are part of the Washington uh, policy of intelligence elite think. Uh, of course, they're, they're the same psychological problems for the uh, Iranian government. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to, to burn the American flag and, and uh, and say death to America one day, and then the next day, oh, come in, let's have a chat. It's, it's, it, you need to have a bit, of a, a bit of a bridge between all of this. So, but it, you know, Iran has suffered too, but it's, Iran has suffered more than just the humiliation of being called the, uh, the axis of evil after Iran offered help to the United States in Western Afghanistan after the United States uh, invaded Afghanistan. It, uh, oh, that's, it suffered far worse. There was Mossadegh. That was one thing that people usually, that's one of the first things that people usually ask me uh, in, those, in those early days in Iran. Uh, why did we do it? Why did the CIA overthrow or help overthrow the first democratically elected uh, government of Iran? Mm -hmm. And incidentally, it wasn't, wasn't until last September you may have noticed that the United Nations General Assembly, that President Obama talked about America's role in the 1953 coup. There's also the problem that both sides have vested interests. Uh, in the case of the United States, you have uh, the conservatives, the right-wingers, who right now are using the, the possibility of, of of an agreement with Iran as a stick to beat uh, Obama with. We have our own, uh, you could call them <laughs> radio ayatollahs if you want, the we, you know, we, we, we have our, uh, we have people who preach against any sort of, uh, any sort of Iraq for law. And then of course, you have the vested interests in America, you have the Israeli-American uh, <coughs> lobby, APAC is, is the main group, which I'm sure most of you have, have heard of. And for the first time in my memory, they seem to be losing some of their power over the American Congress. The APAC has been pushing the American Senate to vote for new sanctions against Iran, which would come into effect if Iran did not uh, carry through on its its promises, or was, was seen to be defaulting in some way in these in these uh, negotiations. Well, APAC has given up. Uh, not quite. Not quite. 
Prime Minister. Put it this way. No, no, a APAC has given up trying to force America into another war. Americans have had enough war for a generation. Um, Iran has its own interests that uh, would perhaps rather like not see a, a resolution. The Revolutionary Guards, who have extensive and highly profitable business interests uh, throughout the Iranian economy, and they derive a lot of their power from this, uh, would not be too, too pleased, I think, to, to see uh, and, uh, and, and end to the standoff. So, with, with all with these, uh, with these <coughs> obstacles, why, why is this happening now? Well, as I said, America's tired of war. Iran won't, America wants to disengage from the Middle East, supposedly to focus on <coughs> Asia. President Obama is looking for some sort of foreign policy uh, legacy. Uh, he would be in a terrible dilemma if he fails with Iran because he has sworn never, ever to allow Iran to possess a, a nuclear bomb. So what does he do if Iran uh, does, in fact, uh, produce bombs? Uh, for Iran, incidentally, there's no real interest. Iran, of course, it, uh, is quite quite firm in insisting that it has no, no desire whatsoever uh, to to produce nuclear weapons. But were Iran, as as many Westerners and Americans uh, uh, fear, to produce a few bombs, that would be the worst possible situation. Uh, it, Iran would open itself to attack from the United States and, and possibly Israel and possibly uh, possibly both. The best situation for Iran would be for Iran to, be, to remain close to a, the red line, but not to cross the line. And that, you may notice, has been the, the situation for the last few years. It's, you, you hear the various Western experts say, well, they're a few months away, or a few, they're half a year away. Uh, and that, that, I suspect, is, is where the nuclear talks will end up, with a, with a freeze with the freeze. Americans, American experts, most of them, see the Iranian uh, nuclear program, a program they think is, is, is meant to <coughs> produce the uh, ability to make nuclear weapons as a bargaining chip, to be traded. Traded for what? Traded for recognition of Iran's position as a, as a, as a regional power. Um, now, Iran for Washington for a long time has been hoping for a regime change. Uh, it, there was the Green Revolution. I, uh, pale Green. Pale Green Revolution. <laughs> there, there was the Arab Spring, which I think many in, the, in Washington misread. Uh, at least what we've seen so far is. Uh, is, is Pretty pale, pretty pale re revolution. Uh, but at any rate, although the United States for a long time appeared to be banking on a collapse of the Iranian regime, it was not, it would not be in American interests. I, I would contend, and I think many experts would think the same. American policy has, has, long, has long been in the Middle East to try to maintain a, a balance of power uh, during the uh, during the terrible war between, between Iraq and Iran when Iraq touched Iran, the United States was, was was as we all know was helping uh, uh, was helping Iraq, uh, and a a collapse of the Iranian regime would be uh, would destroy the balance of power that the United States, in in its wisdom. I would like to maintain. So, the United, Iran on its, its, on its side is tired of sanctions. It, uh, it, the, its president has a, the backing of the, the Supreme Guide, and uh, 
no matter what you, 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 you hear, it does seem that the sanctions are, are causing real problems. You may have seen just brief, recently the, uh, that uh, President Rouhani has been attacked by some of the right-wing newspapers because of the slow delivery of the, the parcels of, of free food that, that is being given out by the So, and then most importantly, and I'll wrap it up, <laughs> the, there's, been a, there's been an overall change in the strategic balance in, of power in the Middle East. After the United States did around a great big favor by, uh, by getting rid of uh, Saddam Hussein, <laughs> And, and thereby increased Iranian influence uh, over Iraq. Eventually, Americans believe that Iran enlarged its, its vision of its, of its place and was hoping, whether or not this was actually the case, was, was hoping to s somehow have an arc of Iranian influence or, or Shia influence that spreads from Western Afghanistan and all the way down through the, uh, to the Mediterranean. Syria was part of that chain of influence, and we, we know what's happening in Syria right now. So in, in some ways, Iran is now, is now much weaker. Well, that, that seems to me like uh, a scenario for possible successful negotiation. I, I don't think I would give it much more than the 50-50 that President Obama gives it, but I think that's pretty amazing. No one would have, no one would have said that you could negotiate with, the, with Iran uh, a few years ago and have a 50-50 chance of coming to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, for sticking to the time. Um, uh, with a positive note of a note of 50-50 chance of success, I think we can move to our next speaker. And before I introduce the next speaker, I was just looking at a quotation from um, the leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, when he was president of Iran in 1986. Um, he was speaking at a conference on Allah Ayatollah's 108th anniversary. And he was talking about the situation of the Muslim world um, and of the Muslims in the subcontinent, and which is perhaps as applicable to our current discussion now. And Ayatollah um, Khamenei at that time said that, um, do the people of the subcontinent, are they very naive to believe that they could win the sympathy of the English? and could soften the hearts of those seasoned and villainous politicians by being friendly and humble towards them. So this is 30 years ago, which Ayatollah Khamenei talked about the Muslim world at that time. So our next speaker is um, Dr. Ehsan Pedram, and he will be talking about the impediments of, the, of Iran's foreign policy. He has been in UK for some years, and currently he's the Foreign Relations Secretary of the Union of Islamic Students uh, Association in UK, um, which I think um, I, the current president of uh, Iran, Mr. Rouhani, when he was in Glasgow, was also involved with the same union. Uh, so please welcome our next speaker in the warm manner. In the name of God, the compassion, the merciful. Thank you very much for your very nice introduction. I've been always telling my uh, friends and the people who know me as a student who's been grown up in the uh, UK and in Europe, and generally my generation, uh, the 80s, who we've not seen the revolution and we have uh, not seen the war. Uh, but yet, we have an idea about the Islamic Revolution and its uh, principles, and uh, most of us actually uh, defend it. Uh, it's very interesting for me, for us to actually express our views and uh, uh, look at the situation uh, from a new angle, uh, rather than uh, people such as Mr. Fenton, who finally uh, shared uh, us his views and his experience uh, closely, and he's been around during the time. 
Um, generally, uh, from my perspective, uh, Iran's uh, foreign policy has been following uh, certain uh, principles in general. One of them has been uh, to fight uh, against the oppression and uh, defend the oppressed. And one of the slogans of the revolution was that no East, no West, only Islamic Revolution or the Islamic Republic, meaning that Iran and the Islamic Republic needs to be independent. So there are two factors. One is independence and one is defending the oppressed. And Iran has constantly been uh, following these principles and these guidelines throughout the past 35 years, uh, which next Tuesday would be the exact 35 anniversary of the Islamic Revolution uh, of Iran. As part of this, uh, some people may raise this question that Iran uh, is only trying to uh, promote this ideological and theological Islamic view uh, to the world. But uh, looking broadly, this is not actually the case. Uh, the case is Iran constantly tries to defend the oppress and fight against oppression. For example, the best example I would raise is that uh, from the beginning of the Islamic Revolution, Iran said we are not going to have relation with uh, two regimes. <coughs> would anyone be in the audience be able to tell me what the two regimes are? Israel and the United States. No, South Africa. Yeah? <laughs> okay. South Africa. That's yeah. it. Okay. Exactly. So one of them is the uh, Zionist regime of Israel. And the other one was the apartheid regime of South Africa. And so this clearly shows that Iran is against racism, is against oppression, as we've been seeing in South Africa at the time. And that was one of Iran's clear red line. And until the downfall of the uh, apartheid regime of South Africa, Iran did not establish relation uh, with that uh, country. So it's not about being uh, the US or being UK or being the Westerners, but uh, again, I want to emphasize this on this point. It's being oppressed and defending the, uh, those who are being oppressed. Uh, so it's not the case about being the US or not. With the US, Iran sees uh, the US in general as the symbol of uh, oppression, uh, oppressing the uh, weaker nations. And the Islamic Revolution, the 1979 Islamic Revolution of Iran, it was a reaction to an action which was being imposed on Iran. And it was the imposition of a cruel and tyrant regime of Shah in Iran, uh, and supporting coup d'etat, plundering the wealth of Iran and the other nations. And the Iranians saw this with the leadership of Imam Khomeini. Uh, they uh, deposed the Shah of Iran and established a new independent regime. And throughout uh, the past 35 years, we are seeing the same uh, principles uh, in Iran's foreign policy. It hasn't changed much. It changes uh, from one side to another, but it's uh, within the same framework. Uh, whether it's Ahmadinejad in power, or Mr. Rouhani, or Mr. Khatami, or Mr. Absanjani, or anyone else, the general concept and general foreign policy in Iran have been the same. And it has resulted in actually uh, Iran's position being uh, promoted and being much more stronger, being uh, increasing in the region. Uh, we have seen the enemies of Iran uh, being uh, uh, thrown away, uh, being uh, uh, defeated one by one. Saddam Hussein, one example, Taliban, another one. And if you want to refer to weaker, uh, weaker puppets, I would say, such as the regime of Yemen, uh, Hosni Mubarak, and uh, so on and so forth. All the enemies have been actually defeated and Iran's position is being emboldened uh, in the region. And these are all due to active foreign policy of the Islamic Republic of Iran. To an extent that John Bolton uh, recently, uh, all of us, most of us, if not all of us, know him. John Bolton, he said that Iran's uh, position uh, in the region is becoming much more prominent and the position of the U.S. is actually weakening. He has officially stated this. Uh, and these are all due to having a constant foreign policy. I was going to uh, talk uh, perhaps uh, a bit more about the, uh, the U.S.-Iran relation uh, as well because that's the elephant in the room. Uh, after all, uh, it was Iran's uh, 
permanent and uh, defiant role against the U.S., which gave it uh, its uh, uh, its uh, prominent role amongst the, especially the Muslims and the oppressed nations, uh, being from Latin America to the region to uh, to other countries. Uh, the relation with Iran uh, and the U.S. it falls more uh, in the framework of uh, ideological, I would say. Uh, and the U.S. has done everything in its power to actually defeat Iran during the past 35 years that we've seen through different means, being the war or being uh, imposition of sanctions or uh, through other methods. Um, but it has been unsuccessful. We've seen a similar interaction between the U.S., I would say, and USSR, the former Russia. Uh, it was an ideological battle. One was uh, the communism, one was completely capitalism. And they were actually uh, co constantly uh, fighting and competing with each other. And it finally led to the downfall of the USSR. We were seeing this similar, uh, uh, similar competitiveness between the US and Iran. One is a completely a theo uh, theological, uh, based on uh, uh, religious laws of Islam. And one is uh, completely capitalistic and worldly, uh, based on the materialistic uh, values in the West. Uh, so we are seeing this ideological battle between the two uh, and the current uh, dialogues that's happening between the two countries, I personally see it as more of a trying to reach a mutual understanding and trying to coexist with each other rather than accepting one another. Uh, that's my personal understanding. And, but we have to see how far this is going to go and whether it's going to uh, reach a decision or not. And we have to bear this in mind, this has been happening after 35 years in public, this relation, this dialogue that you're seeing between the U.S. and Iran, is because uh, the U.S. has finally changed its tone when it comes to speaking to Iran, and that's uh, considering Iran's rights and uh, speaking with Iran uh, with mutual respect, uh, which Iran has been constantly emphasizing on. Iran has been saying, if you uh, treat me uh, dishonestly, and uh, if you do not treat me equally, uh, I will not engage with you in a, uh, in a dialogue. So Iran has been emphasizing on that for 35 years. And finally, the U.S. has dropped its, uh, uh, its war rhetoric, uh, saying that all options are on the table. And finally, the door for dialogue has opened. And we have to uh, see this uh, from this perspective. And that this one, it has this dialogue has only been happening through this mutual respect that has been happening, and if it does not reach a conclusion, uh, I can't see what's going to happen next. It's very hard to predict, but uh, uh, throughout uh, the U.S. and the Senate, that the pressure we are seeing on the Obama uh, and the efforts that are being done to derail the negotiations. Uh, we have to see how much uh, U.S. and the Obama and this administration can uh, and can push the way forward and uh, reach a concrete and uh, meaningful uh, results of these negotiations. I'm sure you are going to have uh, many questions regarding uh, Syria, the Geneva talk, uh, and uh, other uh, issues which uh, relates to Iran's foreign policy. So I think I would leave that for the questions and answer session and uh, in my talks here. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm sure we're going to have a very lively Q&A after our other speaker, uh, which I'll introduce shortly when our media friends will put their microphones in front of the speaker. Uh, the long, arduous road to rapprochement as an option is, I would say, as appetizing to the Iranian public at large and the Islamic Republic of Iran as a dose of cod liver oil, perhaps. Um, so our next speaker will be talking about UK, Iran, what needs to be done. The next speaker, again, has been on this roster on many occasions, and I do welcome him again. And he's a well-known personality in the UK, Lord Nizar Ahmad. Um, in the brief information provided to you, it says that 
He's a member of the British House of Lords. He was appointed on the recommendation of the Prime Minister Tony Blair in 19. 98. And I, I, would have thought, I would have thought I would have thought that was a kiss of death to anyone to be appointed <laughs> by Tony Blair. But however, it has not been a kiss of death to our But, but he regretted it ever since. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't been it hasn't been a kiss of death to our noble lord. And I do welcome him in a very warm manner. Please do welcome him for Bismillah Rahman Rahim, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very distinguished panel. Um, I first of all want to say thank you for uh, inviting me here tonight. Um, I have to uh, say that uh, because Tom uh, talked about his uh, visit to Iran in uh, 1978, uh, I want to go back to 1976. Um, as a student, I went to Iran in 1976. Uh, in the days of Shah and for those people who don't remember him and don't remember uh, his uh, <coughs> government I can tell you as a young man uh, I remember driving um, uh, towards uh, from Turkey towards Iran my car broke down uh, on the border and I managed to get to Maku and then I had to bring my car into Tabriz uh, and then uh, leave my car in the compound in Tabriz. Uh, but the interesting thing was that I was there for about three or four weeks and I was able to see uh, the life in uh, Iran under Shah. And uh, during my a few days in Tabriz, uh, his son came. And there were many people on the street clapping and they were there line, lined up to welcome him. And uh, when I asked uh, my friends who were hosting me, and they said, well, all of us are here at gunpoint. Uh, if we didn't come out, then they would shoot us. And uh, that was uh, the uh, kind of freedom that people had. And quite frankly, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm not making any judgments uh, uh, other than the fact that um, uh, I saw lots of drugs and I saw lots of uh, uh, alcohol and I saw lots of um, uh, other type of life that an Islamic State would not have. Anyway, I've been since, uh, at least two or three times uh, since then and uh, I've just come back uh, from Tehran last week where I attended a conference. Um, now, I'm going to talk about uh, British-Iran relations, but I just want to share with you my observations that uh, uh, after returning to Tehran after 10 years, uh, when Iran has been under sanctions, uh, when we thought that uh, uh, now Iran, like Soviet Union and like all other regimes, because of the sanctions and because of the pressure from the rest of the world, would be uh, sort of starving and there would be no infrastructure and uh, uh, no real good life. And quite frankly, I was very, very pleasantly surprised to see uh, so much infrastructure, so much development going on. Uh, and there are more cars in Tehran than there are in London. And there are more traffic jams in Tehran than in, in London too. Uh, so um, there's lots of activity and uh, um, yes, there is uh, there is uh, uh, inflation. Yes, there is a problem of uh, uh, medicines and uh, other uh, modern equipment. But then Iran has actually depended a lot uh, depended a lot on its own technology, uh, mechanical or electrical. They may not have electronic, and they may not have the most sophisticated. But they are self sufficient to be able to survive. So I, I agree with uh, Hassan that um, uh, Iran, people need to uh, look at Iran in historic and cultural as well as its religious uh, values and pride because Iran is not. Look, I'm, I'm from originally from Kashmir, Pakistan, and I love Pakistan, but Iran is not Pakistan. Iran is not Afghanistan. You can't frighten Iran. Uh, uh, and the Iranian people or uh, frighten them with sanctions or political sanctions or their leadership because Iran will not react in the uh, same way. 
So if you look at uh, British-Iranian uh, relations uh, from 1941 during the war and, and British-Soviet uh, uh, British so uh, Soviet Union invasion until uh, 1946 or uh, come to the uh, uh, Islamic Revolution, uh, we've had turbulent uh, times and we've had uh, uh, our relations which have gone up and down. So when it, whether it is Salman Rushdie uh, or whether it is uh, uh, the events later on, uh, we've had uh, sort of normal relations and difficult relations. Uh, but I think uh, British relations are very much linked to the American and European relations, quite frankly. And even today, uh, when, I'm check, when I check uh, on the Foreign Office uh, uh, reports, then uh, you know, there are three things that are very obvious. Uh, first, uh, Iran's position in terms of, of the Middle East, and it, it, especially Iran's, uh, well, the Foreign Office would say Iran's opposition to the Middle East peace process. Uh, Iran would say Iran's support for the Palestinian people, and rightly so as well, and supporting the Palestinian people. Uh, Iran's uh, nuclear pro program, uh, Iran would say it's for peaceful purposes, uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, British government and the Europeans uh, would argue that uh, the IAEA report on 28th of August 2013, which uh, talks about near 5% uh, to near 20% enriched uranium um, uh, centrifuges, uh, that this is not for only peaceful pur purposes, because the heavy water research reactor uh, which Iran is constructing is not for the use of uh, peaceful purposes, and it's for weapons and uh, uh, weapons grade <coughs> plutonium, uh, uh, and therefore uh, there are concerns. So, so there's the um, Middle East uh, and the peace process. There's the nuclear program, uh, and then uh, British government would talk about uh, the poor record of human rights. Uh, I have to say, uh, similar things are were said about China, and nothing is said about. Uh, Saudi Arabia, nothing is said about UAE, nothing is said about Bahrain, nothing is said about lots of other places. So uh, arguments are uh, the, this. Are, I, what I, I'm, I'm all for human rights, by the way, and there's absolute no doubt in my mind that where every country has to uh, uh, obey the international norms of human rights. But I think. Uh, just to focus on uh, these particular points when you are uh, trying to negotiate and when you're trying to improve relations. Because I believe, Tom and you, you will have seen it, um, Iran's position um, 30 years ago was much weaker. Uh, Iran's position after the Iraq-Iran war was much weaker. Today, Iran is in much stronger position, whether in terms of its own uh, sort of um, uh, survival, uh, even with all these, uh, 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 you know, um, sanctions. Uh, but more importantly, I think that everyone knows uh, that... Um, uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Lebanon Yemen, uh, Bahrain, uh, Afghanistan cannot be resolved without, without the involvement of Iran. And, and so therefore, uh, if uh, uh, us, uh, British uh, and European and the United States of America, if we're really serious about resolving some of these problems, uh, because Iran has actually played very good foreign policy. I've actually been to the Foreign Office where the slogan uh, in, in Farsi it was uh, no East, no West, only Islam, uh, Islamic uh, principles. It, it's still there. And, uh, and yes, I was uh, in the presence of uh, uh, the grand uh, uh, leader, uh, the supreme leader, uh, when there was chanting of death to America. And, there weren't some pleasant things about Britain either, but I didn't understand, so I was, I was smiling. So. <laughs> but but I, I think um, to improve relations, uh, this rhetoric also needs to change. Uh, because I think we've got, we, we as British uh, Muslims and British good people, 
who support peace and uh, reconciliation, who want to reach out to uh, other parts of the world, and who want to see resolution of many of the problems that I've mentioned, then we need to make sure that there, there is a better language and also uh, a mutual respect and trust as well. Because where there's mutual respect and trust, then I honestly think that uh, Iran has huge potential. And for us as British, uh, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm vice chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Entrepreneurship. Uh, I've actually seen uh, the uh, French, the Germans, the uh, Italians uh, already lining up and queuing up for business. Although I was in Dallas this weekend and I read some newspapers there where the American uh, uh, newspapers are warning and saying that the uh, American companies should not make uh, long-term commitments with Iran, only six-month commitments, and we need to see where uh, this uh, six-month uh, period, uh, when it ends, whether Iran is cooperating or not in terms of uh, enrichment and other uh, uh, issues that are being discussed. However, I think uh, there are many others who are uh, lining up. I mean, and the Indians are just there selling everything and anything that they can, uh, they can uh, sell to uh, Iran. So um, I, I think uh, uh, that uh, uh, even though uh, President Obama is going to Saudi Arabia next month, he's already announced the seeking of Allah. I, I have to say, I've got to say, I'm deeply worried. Uh, about the uh, uh, the uh, Arab support for the for the Palestinian people, I'm deeply worried, and I'm deeply worried because of the close ties I see. Now I don't want a, a letter of defamation from Saudi authorities, but I have been told that Saudi Arabia is working with uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Zionist state uh, in, in this particular. It's not uh, that Arab. No, I said Saudi now, so, so please forgive me. But uh, you know, UAE are Arabs as well. So whilst I, you know, and, and I have deep concerns of, about Kuwait and UAE, um, I, I'm not really bothered about uh, if I don't get visa for uh, any of these countries. All I'm saying is that I see their relations with with uh, the Zionist state um, becoming much stronger than the Palestinians, and that really. Uh, if they, if their public finds that out, then it will have sort of consequences on us who are looking for for stability in the region because the people of these countries do not know what their regimes are up to. Um, I can say more, but um, I think uh, basically there is a few more minutes. Oh, okay. Um, basically, um, even though uh, we've had uh, difficult uh, times, I think that. There is a genuine, there is a gen, genuine belief within Parliament, uh, the the old party parliamentary group on uh, Iran. I, I'm the vice chairman, my, my chairman, joint chairman Jack Straw and uh, uh, Ben and also Norman Lamont and and others went to Tehran. Uh, I, I've been to Tehran and I hope that uh, the Iranian uh, members of Parliament will also visit the United Kingdom. I hope rhetoric uh, calms down on both sides, uh, and uh, we should not take any pressure from the uh, the media and from lobbies, because uh, uh, APAC uh, has been mentioned, and there are lobbies in this country as well. Um, and uh, I'm glad that uh, President Obama has made it very clear. Of course, you've been to uh, welcome uh, to Tehran as well. Uh, I just merely mentioned your name, I said on the phone. Um, and uh, so I think that pressure should be uh, resisted and uh, we should um, uh, try and see whatever we can to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, break the ice and rebuild uh, relations between Britain and Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you for the Ahmad. As usual, um, you've stuck to the time, and uh, we have our next speaker who has joined us. And I'll give a few moments to our media friends to put their microphones, and I'll introduce our next speaker. 
He's a well-known activist, a human rights activist, um, always the voice for the oppressed. Speaks eloquently against oppression uh, wherever it occurs. And it's an immense pleasure for me to be introducing our next speaker, who is a member of parliament, has been a member of parliament for over 30 years, almost as long as the Islamic Revolution, I suspect. Um, and he is Jeremy Corbyn, who has recently returned from <coughs> Iran as a member of um, the parliamentarians. Please welcome Jeremy in a warm manner. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Sorry it's a bit late coming. I was delayed in Parliament and we not, not on today. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to be invited here and I do welcome the work done by the Gulf Cultural Club over a long period of time in providing an opportunity and a space for people to uh, discuss things in a good manner that are going on throughout the region and in the Middle East. My background to all this is that I'm uh, chair of the Stop War Coalition and national vice chair of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and have been involved in a large number of issues throughout the region, obviously the uh, supporting the Palestinian people and have had the opportunity of visiting most countries in the region where there is a Palestinian diaspora or refugee camps and obviously in Gaza and the West Bank itself. And uh, in the opposition that we mounted to the Afghanistan war, I don't think any of us believed that a very short time later uh, this country would be at war with Iraq. And that only came after the Axis of Evil speech of 2002 by Bush. We then went to war with Iraq and uh, despite the presence of all those people on the streets and all the obvious <coughs> opposition to it and the obvious um, non-existence of weapons of mass destruction, there always seemed to me to be an agenda going back a very long way of the US and Britain to uh, have conflicts with Iran. Britain's involvement with Iran isn't new, it goes back to the Persian times, it goes back to the Anglo-Iranian oil company, it goes back to the foundation of BP, it goes back to the occupation of Iran during the Second World War by Britain and the USSR, and it more recently goes back to the thwarting of um, Iranian um, sentiments, Iranian nationalist sentiments in the revolution of 1952 and the coup that was inspired there against the uh, elected um, Iranian government by Britain and the um, USA. We then had the Shah and uh, the um, police force organized by the Shah and large numbers of Iranians took exile in this country and many of them still live here and did some of my constituency. We then also had the um, Islamic Revolution of 1979 and a complete break with relations with the USA and um, of Britain. And uh, when we came to the Iraq war, this is bringing the, thing, the two things that parallels back up to date, there was then, I think, a serious danger of an attack taking place on Iran. And so many of us counseled very strongly against this and wanted to have better relations with, the, with Iran. That's not to say uh, I'm not very critical of the human rights record in Iran, and I said so and would continue to say so, and uh, I'm personally not a supporter of having nuclear power. However, I recognize that in international law, it is perfectly legal to be able to process uranium to develop a civil nuclear power process. I also recognize that Iran is a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that remains a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, as far as I know, has no plans to leave. And so, in the all-party group on Iran, and um, as my good friend, my lord, have told me a few moments ago, it is a very genuinely all-party group, and it does represent a huge swathe of political opinion and all sorts of other issues within, within our group. And we were keen 
to develop a relationship um, with Iran. So we've done a number of things. One is a small delegation of us went to the International Atomic Energy Authority two years ago at the height of the claim that Iran was in the process of developing nuclear weapons in order to assess with them what the real existence was of um, enriched uranium and um, at what point it was being processed and more importantly what obstructions or none were being put in the way of the inspectors by the government of Iran. And we then wanted to have a delegation to Iran but in the meantime the British Embassy was closed because of the um, incident when a number of people invaded the Embassy and the, the, as a parallel the Iranian Embassy in London was closed. And after some, some talks we were uh, invited by the Iranian Parliament to send a small delegation to Iran and uh, the delegation was duly asked to go. The delegation consisted of um, MP Ben Wallace, who's one of the joint chairs of the group, Lord Lamont, former Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jack Straw, former Foreign Secretary, and myself. Uh, we don't have an awful lot in common politically on most other issues. So when we presented ourselves as a genuine representation of the diversity of British opinion in the, uh, British public opinion in Parliament, that was eventually understood and accepted that we, um, Jack Straw and I, have got issues going back to Iraq War, Afghanistan War, General Pinochet, anti-terror legislation, quite a lot of things actually. We had a whole week to discuss them. And Lord Lamont and I have got a few things going back a long way on economic policies, privatisation, General Pinochet, and a number of other things. And so there was plenty of opportunity for those kind of discussions. The point of the visit was that we wanted to be able to build a relationship with Iraq. My mind went back to attending the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty PrepCon for the review conference last year um, in Geneva. And I heard the speeches from the Arab League, from Egypt, from a number of other countries, all of whom said that unless the MPT leadership can arrange a um, conference of all of the countries in the region, including Israel, as part of uh, the development of a nuclear weapons free, or more accurately, weapons of mass destruction free zone across the Middle East, then they're going to walk out of the NPT. I think that would be disastrous if anybody walked out of the NPT. I think the NPT is an important thing for us all to grasp hold of. And, um, our, our purpose then was to visit in order to have a discussion about all, all the, the nuclear program and about relations with them and a number of other things. I would also say that what has significantly changed, I'll finish this point, so I can see you're giving your watch to no, no. Uh, What I would well, say is well, yeah. very significantly changed in this country was the vote in the British Parliament in August not to participate in the um, war in <coughs> Syria. Um, I was opposed to Afghanistan and Iraq and um, it would be hardly surprising if I was opposed to the war in Syria as well. Not because um, I want the war in Syria to continue, but I couldn't see how Western intervention would do anything other than make the situation even worse, even more complicated and even more dangerous and um, would set off a chain of events that might be uncontrollable. By the fact of the British Parliament, for varying reasons, I mean, not everyone holds my view in the British Parliament, but some of those who also voted against hold a very different view on lots of things, but nevertheless saw no point in this. By not participating, I don't say it was the only factor, but it was no doubt a causal factor in the US uh, Congress not participating, that in turn set off a chain of events which led to a developing relationship between Russia and the United States, Syria signing the Chemical Weapons Convention, a relationship with Iran, the nuclear uh, temporary agreement, the interim agreement which has six months to run with Iran, and the real possibility of reopening normal relations with Iran. I think all that is very positive. And I make the point now, I made it I made it in Parliament and I made it throughout our visit that I want to see the Geneva II Peace Conference on Syria work 
but to work, it must include all the countries in the region, and I think Iran should be around the table, along with all the neighbouring countries as well, if it's to mean anything and be effective. <clears throat> Our visit was to meet the Parliament. We were guests of the Parliament of Iran. We had numerous meetings with uh, many colleagues in, in the Parliament in Iran. We also visited the Peace Museum. We had a very long meeting with the Foreign Minister for an hour and a half and we met a number of other ministers and ministries and we raised a lot of issues, mainly discussing the um, chemical weapons issue, Syria, nuclear weapons, and I also raised issues about Iran's um, welcome participation in the UN Human Rights Council and was assured that their universal periodic review response would be delivered as it's required to be in June of this year and that with the lifting of sanctions and the development of normal relations there would be a resumption of a dialogue with the European Union. The way forward surely is to recognise the incredible history of Iran, of Persia and its huge contribution to the rest of the world, that it is an advanced, developed country, that it does have a functioning parliamentary system, that it is uh, an important economic force within the region, and the economic <coughs> sanctions against Iran have been largely counterproductive. At one level, they've limited the supply of advanced medicines to people in Iran. They've clearly had a financial effect. They've had a very bad effect on much of the Iranian diaspora, and I get families coming to me all the time who want to go home, send money home, relatives visit, all those kind of normal things. But it's also led to a reduction in trade with, the, with Europe and the rest of the world. And so I think the possibility of gaining a full agreement within six months is very high. We've invited the Iranian parliament to come and visit Britain as a reciprocal visit, and they've accepted our invitation, and we're looking forward to welcoming them at some point. We don't know the date later this year, and I look forward to that visit, because I think it'll be an important way forward. If we want there to be peace in the world, there has to be an understanding, a recognition, of cultural diversity, of differing histories, and an understanding that um, despite um, our often myopic view of our own history, Britain's role in the region has not always been a good one. The colonialism, the uh, coup that was inspired against Iran, the occupations that have been done, the colonialism, and the um, diversity of views on um, Palestine and Israel, stemming from the Balfour Declaration, the foundation of the State of Israel, Nakba, and now the awful position that so many Palestinian refugees hold. I think Iran is a key factor in the whole region in bringing about peace and stability. And therefore, I want to see a reopening of normal relations. And uh, having visited the British Embassy, it would be perfectly possible to open it in a very short space of time. It's so largely superficial, the problems that exist there. It's the, the problems are political and in the mind, not in the physical um, state of the building. And so uh, my visit was, to me, absolutely fascinating. I found it very, very interesting and fascinating by the history of the whole region anyway. And if our visit made any difference and helps to bring about normal relations, then I think that's got to be seen as a good thing. It's far better to have small groups of MPs going there than bombs being sent over each way and, and, a, and yet another disastrous war breaking out. We don't need another war. We need peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed, Jeremy, we don't need another war, we need peace. And I hope um, the presentations today uh, by our four eminently knowledgeable speakers and those who have been to Iran recently and in the past um, really gives it a flavour and the dimension of what's going on. And again, I will just quote a few lines and open the floor for Q&A. We've got about half an hour of Q&A. Again, this is from a speech given by Ayatollah Khamenei in 1986, when he was the president of Iran. And he says, uh, Iran is infu infused with the rich Islamic spirit and drawing upon the inexhaustible reservoirs of Islamic heritage, a nation which has become self-sufficient and has discarded all the glittering Western ornaments and is marching ahead courageously determining its own targets, determining its own targets and moving to attain them, advancing with the frenzy of a lover and has not imprisoned itself within the walls of nationalism 
and racialism. And I think if all nations can move in that direction of discarding nationalism and racialism, we'll certainly be a happy planet. I'll open the floor for q and I see lots of hands immediately. I'll take the brother first. He was immediately. And please, those who do want to ask questions, don't leave it for the last two minutes.